So how many of you washed your hands this morning? Okay, that's 99%. That's a good start. How many of you think you're a super organism? All right, we'll get there. And um, how many of you have you've heard of fecal transplant? Okay, you need microbiology here in uh, the programs at this university. So anyway, let's talk about microbiology today a little bit more. So most of you might not realize that microorganisms inhabit everywhere. Everything you touch, what you touched when you came in the room today, you're probably covered in the bacteria that the person beside you just coughed all over you. Everybody you shook hands with, you're like carrying their signatures. No smiling faces anymore. But um, they're invisible to the naked eye. They've been around for a really long time. And they are uh, um, ex estimated to account for more than half of Earth's biomass. They reside in extreme environments. We're looking at spacecraft. We're looking at airplanes. We're looking at um, uh, acid lakes, alkaline lakes, you name it, for microbial species. And we know they're essential to our survival and our wellness. My um, analogy for thinking about microbial species in general is looking at dark matter and what happened when we started to explore space. And I remember when I was a little girl and we had five planets. I know I'm dating myself. Everybody thinks I'm like 21 years old. But when I was a kid, we were told that there were five planets and there were five domains of life. Now we know that's absolutely not true. Now we know that there's a lot to be learned and we're still exploring and learning more on a daily basis. And to me, microbiology is essentially just like that. Once we started developing new technologies that allowed us to look at microbial diversity in the environment, we realized that there were so many microbial species out there, the majority of which we have absolutely no idea about. We still estimate that we can only culture about 1% to 2% of all the microbes on the planet, but we have sequencing technologies whereby we're able to look at all the genetic information of these microbes and understand what they're able to do. Most of you have only heard about E. coli, but there's a lot more out there than just E. coli. And there are bad bugs and there are good bugs. And I want to talk to you about the good bugs because the majority of them really are good bugs. Now, what we have learned over the last 10 to 12 years, and one of my biggest claims to fame is that I sequenced the first human microbiome. And how many of you have heard that word before? Show of hands. This is pretty bad. Um, <laughs> So this refers to the millions of microbial species that live in and on the human body. And essentially, like they're, they account for about the size of your brain. So all of you are carrying about three pounds of bacteria with you. Even though you went to the bathroom this morning, you're still carrying about three pounds of bacteria with you. They live in your gut. They live on your skin. They live in your oral cavity. And as much as you try and get rid of them, they're there for a purpose. They rapidly start to populate our bodies after we are born, after you have a, uh, give birth, and they stay with us through life, and they're essential for um, metabolizing plant compounds. All you ve vegetarians in the audience, you could not live without the microbial species in your GI tract. And all of you who have acne probably have a little problem with your friendly microbial species that are out of whack. And from here on, I'll re refer to the term as a dysbiosis, so ma mainly your normal population of microbes that inhabits your body gets out of whack and you develop some kind of unhealthy signature. It could be diarrhea, it could be acne, it could be any GI disorders, irritable bowel syndrome, um, IBD, Crohn's disease. These all have correlations with the microbes that live in and on the human body. And here's a subset of just some of the research programs at my organization where we're looking at microbiomes that are associated with human health. And we're not saying that microbes cause these diseases. We're not saying microbes cause colon cancer. We're not saying they cause oral cancer. We're not saying they cause fatty liver disease. But by studying large cohorts of people, we're able to see correlations between the microbes and these diseases that suggest that there is some relationship there. And the field is still very young, and we're trying to get a better understanding of what exactly these microbes do and why they're so important for our health and disease conditions. Again, I mentioned the word dysbiosis. So if you don't take anything away from my talk today, because I know we're not all microbiologists in the audience here, the microbes that live in and on the human body are very important for educating our immune system. They're even showing relationships between the microbes in our body and stress and mental health. 
uh, diseases like autism, schizophrenia, they're investigating for the correlations with microbes that live in and on us. We know that keeping the microbes in your GI tract healthy is very important for disease prevention. We know that there are huge commercial um, endeavors springing up globally to start using these microbial signatures associated with the human body in the development of new diagnostic approaches to diseases. And also, we think that this whole field of human microbiome research is going to push this concept of personalized health. One thing you'll all also learn in this field is that no two people in this audience has the same exact microbiome. So we have differences even within this population. When you start going to other parts of the world, you see even greater differences. So my team has done work in West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa also, and we see microbial signatures that we don't see in the West any, at all. And for example, we did some work with the, a group called the BACA, who live a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, so basically they're still out foraging for their food. And when you look at the microbiomes of these people, they're actually more similar to the microbiomes of non-human primates compared to when you look at agriculturalists who have exposure to processed foods and antibiotics and prophylactic uh, treatments, where their microbiome starts to look closer to um, hamburger eaters or people who uh, reside in the West. And we're not saying that one diet is worse than the other, but we're using these signatures associated with lifestyle to understand how the microbiome has evolved to be a signature within the human body and seeing these really interesting correlations of these millions of microbial species that live in our body that 10 years ago or 12 years ago we had absolutely no understanding of. I also want to put a plug in for, you know, I said microbes are found everywhere. They're in the bathrooms you all just went in, and we heard the talk earlier about algae, and so we know that we flush them out routinely. But things like looking at pieces of art, um, I'm a member of a team called the Leonardo uh, Research Project, where we're trying to understand microbes that are associated with very ancient pieces of art. Can you look at an ancient piece of art and look at a fingerprint and actually trace to see where, who the fingerprint came from, how long the fingerprint has been on that piece of art? Can you look at communities that have assembled on pieces of art to see if they were stolen from somebody's house? So we're actually using microbial studies to look in forensics. Um, we're trying to look at microbes in terms of understanding how new pathogens emerge. All of you have heard about new pathogenic species that are cropping up all over the world. We don't understand how these organisms do it. We don't understand the selective pressures that make them become more dangerous in nature. But by, able, but by e being able to use new technologies and sequence all of this genetic information from various samples, we're, trying, we're starting to get understandings of how organisms evolve and are actually able to travel one, from one place to another. And the last thing that I want to mention in terms of the value of looking at microbial species outside of just looking at the human gut is in the field of forensics. And now we're in discussions about looking at microbial signatures on hair and in stool from uh, human traffic victims or young kids who can't speak or tell you who their parents were or what country they were in. You could probably look at a microbial signature associated with their body and trace which country they had been in within the last 30 to 60 days as a result of these microbial signatures that are associated with the environment that they live in. So um, in closing, uh, we started off talking about the complexity and simplexity and some big words and simple and complex. And I'm not sure where I fall, but I hope I'm complex, just based on some of the images I saw today. Um, it's amazing to think that organisms that are so tiny and so simple, we can't even see them with the naked eye, are in fact really complex. They're really smart, if you think about it. They figured out how to survive by rapidly populating our offspring. They figured out how to dominate any environment that you look at. And they figured out how to ensure their survival, um, even though we try repeatedly to get rid of them, especially on a daily basis. And just think about exploration of this dark matter called microbial species and our own human microbiome next time you try to wash everything off your hand and your face. So with closing, I'll leave that, leave that thought with you guys. <laughs>